Good afternoon and welcome to the LaRue Show. This is our special New Year's program to bring into existence the year of LaRouche, a year of decision. It's January 1st, 2011. We are now in a new year, so pay attention today because we're going to part two of our program on the new LaRouche candidate slate. Joining me today will be Diane Sayre from New Jersey and Dave Christie from Washington State. And we'll be discussing an extraordinary developing situation, which has been described in two different releases put up on the LaRouche Pack website this week uh, by Lyndon LaRouche. One is titled The Day After Christmas, and the other one, I don't have the exact title in front of me, but it, it has to do with the idea of LPAC determining the news. Now, what he identified in these two releases is the, as I said, the extraordinary circumstances of the last week of 2010. Because you have, while many people were trying to hide their fears, their frustrations by diving into the rum punch and crawling under the Christmas tree and surrounding themselves with uh, presents that are too expensive and that they're probably going to return, probably have already returned, to try and hide from reality, you can't hide from reality. And the reality is that the financial system is dead. It's crashed. It's gone. In the same way, in July 2007, Lyndon LaRouche identified the, the coming death of the banking system. And as he has in all of his forecasts in the last 40 years, he was deadly accurate by saying that the banking system has collapsed. And unless there's a change in the banking system to a financial system as a credit system modeled on the American system of Alexander Hamilton, what he warned in that July 2007 broadcast was that we're headed toward fascism. Well, since that time, we've had President Obama steal the 2008 election, lie repeatedly to the American people. Again, Lyndon LaRouche has consistently identified the crisis. Don't forget, we also had the September 2008 collapse of the banking system. And since September 2008, the banking system has been on life support from the U.S. Federal Reserve. Without trillions of dollars of new obligations created by the Federal Reserve, this banking system would have been put into bankruptcy. Were it not for the corruption of the Bush, Cheney, Hank Paulson team, in the end of 2008, and then since January 2009, the corruption and the swindle continued by the Obama team with uh, Tim Geithner, Larry Summers, and Ben Bernanke. They have been committing trillions of dollars, not just to bail out the, the large U.S. banks like J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, but to bail out the European banking system. And this has continued non-stop, at the same time that Obama has increasingly made clear that his policy is the policy of Adolf Hitler from 1939 of saving money to bail out the banks by killing the elderly, the sick, and the poor, by cuts in Medicare and Medicaid, by letting the states go and cities go bankrupt. That's the Obama policy. And after the November election, when this policy was rejected by the American people, the problem is the American people didn't have an alternative outside of the three LaRouche candidates. And the American people did not elect the LaRouche candidates. They did not force the Democrats in the lame duck session to fight this, despite the leadership from Lyndon LaRouche, despite Lynn's consistent analysis where he's been absolutely sharp on what the problems are, but at the same time offered a solution. In the tradition of the Hamiltonian credit policy of the American system, of reviving the Glass-Steagall legislation, of bailing out the states and city governments, because those immediately affect lives, and then injecting credit through a reorganized banking system, for the purposes of putting people back to work in great projects, starting with the North American Water and Power Alliance. That was the LaRouche solution. And he insisted that it wouldn't work unless you get Barack Obama out first. Now, what's happened in the period from November 2nd to the present? 
the Democrats, again, showed no direction, no guts. They buckled. They accepted the witch hunt against Charlie Rangel. They accepted Obama's move into the Republican camp. And I would say that's not much of a move. He's already been there. His health care bill was a bill for the insurance companies. He bailed out the banks. He's protected the banks with the, the phony financial reform bill. And so now here we are at the end of this year, and we're coming up to an extraordinary convergence of a year-end crisis, which is characterized by an absolute lack of cash available for hedge funds, for private equity funds, who are scrambling to get money. Banks are scrambling to get money in the U.S. and Europe. And there's a reaction developing from the population against more bailouts. That reaction was already there. That was what the mass strike was about. The demonstrations in the summer of 2009 in the United States against the health care bill, the anger that was expressed in the election in November 2010, it was all about the American people, frightened, angry, frustrated, about a government that's committing trillions of dollars to bail out crooks and swindlers, the international financial banks, especially those connected to the inter-alpha group of banks, which controls most of the currency and, and uh, commodity speculation. It handles the, the credit derivatives, the credit default swaps. It's this banking system which is bankrupt, which is being defended and protected by the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank. And as we come into the end of this year, what LaRouche said is this swindle is not going to last, that the period coming up at the end of this year with the contracts that banks have to meet, that hedge funds have to meet, that the fact that there's not enough liquidity, their only alternative is to print more money, which is going to lead to a hyperinflationary blowout at the beginning of 2011. And right on cue, President Obama put through an executive order through his medical care czar, Donald Berwick, who's a pro-British national health care system fascist killer, that Berwick and Obama have issued an order, which was not in the health care bill that went through the Congress, which calls for end-of-life counseling, which is a cover phrase for killing the so-called useless eaters, those who have lives not worth living which we identified from the beginning as the intention of this health care bill to go back to the Hitler policy of September 1939, which was carried out under the guise of the T4 declaration, the Tiergartenstrasse 4 declaration of the Nazis, that in order to save money, the sick, the mentally ill, the terminally ill will be terminated, will be killed. And this was determined at the Nuremberg trial after the war, to have been the beginning of the death camp policy of the Nazis. And today, the President of the United States is standing in front of cameras, proudly saying, this is not a death panel policy, this is a good policy for the American people to improve the health and to improve the financial security of this nation. And he has to be thrown out. The candidates' movement is saying there should be no Hitler in the White House. And that's the policy we have to adhere to. So we're going to have a discussion today with two of the candidates. Uh, one of the things that came up at the end of the year was the decision by Mr. LaRouche and the LaRouche PAC team to add three candidates to the slate we had last year, Rachel Brown in Boston, Summer Shields in San Francisco, and Keisha Rogers in uh, Houston. And last week we heard from Keisha and Bill Roberts, who's one of the new candidates who's running in the Detroit area, Today, I'm very happy to introduce to you the other two new candidates, Diane Sayre from New Jersey and Dave Christie from Seattle, Washington. So, Diane and Dave, welcome to the program. Thank you, Harley. Diane, let me begin with you because you have a very powerful video statement that's up on the LaRouche Pack website uh, in which you introduce yourself and discuss your campaign, why you're running. Why don't you give our listeners a, a, a summary of what you said there? All right. Well, we had gotten a um, 
briefing from Mr. LaRouche in the morning, and he was uh, addressing, I mean, exactly what you've discussed, the blowout of the system occurring uh, around payments due and things like that at the beginning of the year, and the fact that uh, Obama is now going for Hitlerian fascism just very boldly, and um, he basically rammed through under executive order the parts of the health care bill that the Congress could not stomach earlier, and it's very explicit, which is that doctors who encourage patients to drop dead will be rewarded, and doctors who don't do that, who try and prolong people's lives, will um, be penalized. And I have to say, I mean, I was thinking of all kinds of things. When I first heard Obama, when he first got into office and he was saying, and I forget what percentage, like 80% or something or other, of Medicare dollars were spent on people in their last two years of life, I thought, what a bizarre thing to say. I mean, isn't it obvious you pay into Medicare, and then when you get old and sick and you need the money, they spend the money on you because that's what you paid into it for. But instead, the idea is that the human beings are expendable. We worship the bailouts. We worship money. And and part of what I was thinking in my statement is how people – had fallen into the trap of the November 2nd elections. And, of course, LaRouche emphatically warned the Democratic Party that they had to take action to remove Obama and reinstate Glass-Steagall if they didn't want to suffer a total bloodbath wipeout on November 2nd. They did not do this. And so, lo and behold, what occurred is the population who is desperate, who are being foreclosed upon, taxes increase, Uh, you know, they voted out of rage and hatred of the policy to dump all the incumbents, anyone associated with Obama. In California, it was slightly different because they were voting more against Schwarzenegger, who's sort of got the same policy, um, and brought in people like Rand Paul, uh, total extremists. We had it earlier here in New Jersey when Christie got elected because Corzine was foolish enough to have Obama campaign for him. And and what's the idea? Your neighbor is your enemy. So it's not only that we have a Hitler in the White House, but if the population succumbs to the pessimism and despair, you have a population who are prepared to become Nazis. And well, that's that's, that's a wanted. change, isn't it, Diane? Because you know, historically, the American people, under good leadership, have fought Nazis. The American people have. Right. It sometimes takes a lot to get us to fight, but we have gone back to the American system. This is a shift to actually take people's rage and have, especially the younger people, turn against their parents and grandparents. Exactly. Exactly. And you see it and and you hear it and people say things. Now, happily, I can tell you from my experience of talking to people that it, it's a millimeter deep. But it, if it's perceived as the public opinion, that's why people go along with it. So they say, those, you know, teachers, their pensions are too big. Or the police, the policemen, you know, they don't do anything. Uh, they, they shouldn't be paid so much. They're not risking anything. The firefighters, well, who needs them? They're making too much money. And people don't step back and say, wait a minute. I mean, all right, suppose a teacher makes $100,000 a year. You could say, well, that's a fairly hefty salary. But, you know, how much is um, the head of AIG making or the head of any health insurance company making? I think the average salary of a CEO of an insurance company is something like $400 million a year. But somehow the rage is being directed at large groups of fellow Americans or at immigrants, and also what you're reporting. I have run across this um, on campuses and elsewhere where you have people, absolutely the younger people are being turned against the elderly in a way which is totally uh, terrifying. You may not remember this, but but this was the strategy back in the late 80s, early 90s by Pete Peterson, who set up the Peterson Commission, which is the prototype for the President's Deficit Reduction Committee which was the idea that you can win the younger people by turning them against the 
the unfair tax against them in order to take care of the elderly. And this was an explicit statement. Governor Lamb of Colorado came out and said it's time for the elderly to be like leaves and drop from the tree. Uh, you had a whole mobilization around this. There was also the attempt by <clears throat> Bush and Cheney in 2005 to go after Social Security. And at that time, uh, our organization, under Lyndon LaRouche's direction, mobilized the Democrats to fight. Now, here we're in a slightly different situation where the Democrats are sitting there with their tails between their legs, their heads down, uh, and some of them are continuing to support the president. So, Diane, how do you see the mobilization of, of this candidate slate as a way to both provide leadership in the Democratic Party and then to move the population? Well, um, I mean, one aspect which is really important is what we've done on NAWAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance. And the six of us are going to collaborate on uh, presenting this as a whole for the nation and for the world, because I think part of why people react against the mustache is they don't uh, fully appreciate how evil Obama's policies are because they're unaware of what the nation actually could be doing. So they're missing the contrast. They're saying, oh, well, it's only a little bit worse than it was under Bush, or, you know, they have a stupid standard of comparison. So that if you're thinking, well, really, we should have been mining helium-3 on the moon and have nuclear fusion by now, and there's no reason to have deserts taking over the Midwest of the United States, and we could have 10 million people gainfully employed in engineering and science and production, if people begin to get a taste of what the nation actually could be doing and a real sense of pride like people had when we put a man on the moon or what we had when we built the Transcontinental Railroad, which obviously we weren't around for, but <laughs> you can imagine, you know, the na this was a huge celebration and people all over the world emulated this. And I think that's the the goodness of the American people that the six of us have to reach and mobilize, and then people will get a sense of a, of a passion to fight. This is going to be a fight to save the country. All right, you're listening to Diane Sayre, who is a Democratic candidate for Congress in New Jersey, who is not yet, uh, we've not yet decided which district because of the questions up around redistricting for New Jersey, but we'll have that shortly. Uh, this is the special New Year's program of the LaRouche Show, where I'm talking with two of the new candidates on the LaRouche candidate slate. Let me also mention, so you can put it on your calendar now, the January 22nd will be the next LaRouche webcast. <clears throat> that will be at 1 p.m. Eastern Time from Washington, D.C. Put that on your calendar and start organizing now. Get it on the calendar of your friends, your neighbors, your workplace, people in church, school, this should be the, the moment where people recognize that it's not enough to realize that LaRouche has been right. You have to back them up. So January 22nd is the next LaRouche webcast. Now, let me bring on Dave Christie, who's up in the Seattle area. Uh, in Dave's case, he does know who he's running against, and it's actually a very interesting campaign. Dave, uh, welcome to the program, and why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing up in Seattle? Well, uh, uh, I'll be actually running in the 9th Congressional District of Washington State, which is actually currently held by Adam Smith. Uh, you know, Adam Smith, we've, we've had a history of uh, uh, intervening on him. Now, he's a Democrat. Uh, particularly, what's that? He's a Democrat, so you'll be opposing yes. him in the Democratic primary. Yeah, I believe he's part of the, you know, what they call the DLC wing of the Democratic Party, which, of course, uh, in essence is to destroy the Roosevelt legacy within the Democratic Party. Uh, we've had our, our fights with him, uh, especially around the impeachment of Cheney, which we had led, and he opposed and effectively was going along with the uh, Pelosi wing of the misleadership of the Democratic Party. Um <clears throat> But I, I think uh, perhaps one of the more interesting things about Adam Smith is the unfortunate reality that he shares the name Adam Smith with the famous scoundrel from the 18th century, the British East India Company's propagandist, Adam Smith. 
the enemy of the and American Revolution. What's that? The enemy of the American Revolution. Exactly. Yeah, there's no uh, coincidence. Uh, or the, it's not a mere coincidence that he writes The Wealth of Nations in 1776, uh, which is an explicit attack on the emerging American system, which was to fly in the face of the uh, imperial policy of the British East India Company. Um, and, you know, in, in light of that, I actually had issued a statement concerning the, the T4 policy. And, you know, Adam Smith's, poly, uh, the, the philosopher, that is, the uh, economist uh, Adam Smith's philosophy, which really at the core of it is the idea that man is just a beast. You are pursuing pleasure. You are avoiding pain. And somehow the aggregate of all of those individuals makes up the magic of the marketplace. And, you know, this this insane philosophy is actually the core of uh, also the later developments around uh, Jeremy Bentham, who also was uh, with the British East India Company. And it was his utilitarian theory, which uh, was actually cited in the Nuremberg trials, this uh, utilitarian theory, which effectively views each individual as a commodity to be used and abused within the market system and when their usefulness has been used up to be discarded. And I think that's exactly what was at the core of the Hitlerian T4 uh, euthanasia policy, the idea of the life not worthy to be lived. And that was actually the utilitarian theory was actually cited in the Nuremberg trials as being the the core philosophy of the Nazi regime. Now, Dave, and, let, me, let me just interrupt yeah. you here, because I think this is a, a really important point, and I just discussed this with uh, Mr. LaRouche over the last couple of days, and I, I think we have to make this completely explicit. You and Diane both have, but I just want to add my, my voice to this. When we put the mustache on Obama, it actually was to reflect the reality that he put it there himself. He not only campaigned for this Hitler T4 policy, he lied about it. And then when the Congress wouldn't go along with it, they had this strategy. He appointed Berwick, who could not get confirmed by the Congress, so he had to make a recess appointment of Berwick. Berwick has come in and taken the reins in this and said, this is an essential part of our health care policy. Why? Because Obama promised to save money. That's the exact explanation Hitler had for the initial T4 policy, that they didn't have enough hospital beds or medical care to take care of all the soldiers who were going to be hurt in the war, and therefore they had to clear those spaces and save that money by getting rid of the useless eaters. Now, Obama pushed this policy through by executive order. How is that not a Hitler policy? It is, and I encourage people to go to our website where we've posted a video from 2009 which made this case back then. And you'll see that we've been on this and we've been right. So, Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to make sure that for people who still are afraid, well, aren't you just overstating the case, this is an exact historic example Mm -hmm. of how if people aren't paying attention, and, you know, there are a lot of Americans who ask the question, How could the Nazis have done this? How could the German people have let the Nazis do it? Well, the question we have to pose is, if you don't fight to immediately remove Obama, then you bear the moral culpability that you want to ascribe to the German people. That is, this is fascism, this is genocide, and you're turning your back to it. So go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to add, I, I, you know, I had a... Uh, watched the documentary that actually was basically just live or you know uh, footage of the Nuremberg trials. And at a certain point, I, about you know say 10, 15 minutes into it, I I, my, I was watching with my wife and I looked over to her and I said, what what are they doing here? And what I was asking was, is I said, why are they going through this very methodical? Uh, extremely, you know, this ar- legal argument, they're, they're filling it out to the T, and I was confused because I thought, well, show the footage of the concentration camps, show the signature of the of Nazi official, and, you know, bring them out back, and uh, I guess eventually they hanged them, right? But I thought that's what the Nuremberg trials would be. But 
what I was stunned with was how uh, precisely exacting they were trying to be with the what I realized they were doing was they were creating a legal precedent right. and a very thorough legal argument to prevent this kind of atrocity from occurring again. And what was identified clearly as, you know, as I mentioned, this utilitarian theory, but, you know, what Leo Alexander said, which I think is uh, a very stunning um, idea, which is that the, the T4 policy, the useless eater policy, was the infinitely small wedge that was brought in and created the conditions for all of the later atrocities of the Nazi regime. Now, Leo Alexander, Leo Alexander was an American psychiatrist who was part of the team that prosecuted the Nazi doctors at Nuremberg. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. And that idea that he brings up of the philosophical uh, conceptions as ultimately guiding what the economic policy started out as, the, the, the abuse of the individual as just a mere commodity in the market, and the eventual uh, discarding and treating a, a human individual, a human soul, as if it were just some piece of machinery that once it didn't work, to throw it out and burn it up. And that uh, um, The other thing I would just like to mention, because I, I, I think it was also stunning watching these Nuremberg trials, was... Somebody like Goering, uh, who sat there just still proud as a peacock, you know, while they're while they're basically on the verge of uh, sentencing him to death, uh, still proud of what he had done, and it it somewhat was a, a stunning irony of somebody like Blumenauer, uh, the Oregon State's third congressional district, where he has this email saying, you know, well, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't bring up the fact that we're actually pushing a euthanasia policy and we could just sort of sneak it in. And, you know, I just thought of what Goering might say to Blumenauer, you know, why are you being such a wimp about pushing a fascist policy? Just go for it. Um, hmm. Well, this is, this is the kind of language the American people are not used to hearing, namely people telling the truth. And I think this is one of the key elements that the LaRouche slate or the LaRouche Committee, is going to bring to the elections. And, and Diane, how do you see that? How, how do you see your role as a candidate uh, who will be in New Jersey, but you're functioning as part of the slate? Well, uh, one thing I've been thinking about is we're really fortunate that we're launching these campaigns two years in advance because I think a lot of what we have to say to our constituents and to the nation generally is going to to them, feel like fingernails on the blackboard. <laughs> I think um, people are not going to be very comfortable, hopefully, uh, if we're doing our job, because obviously the country wouldn't be in this mess if the population had uh, been a little better. So if we're doing our job, they're not going to be very thrilled about what we have to say, excepting on a certain deeper level where I think the truth resonates within people. And I think uh, we're, we're going to recruit. I mean, we have to restore the Democratic Party to the FDR legacy, and we have to find those Republicans who think of themselves in the tradition of Abraham Lincoln and not these crazy, you know, whatever they are, uh, neoconservative um, Rand Paul types. I mean, one thing I, th- I think is very ironic is how many of these people claim they're for the Constitution, I'm for the Constitution, and then they think we shouldn't have a government. Hmm. I mean, how can you be for the Constitution and be against having a government? So I think our job as the six, in a sense, is largely we're going to educate the population, we're going to remind Americans of our very proud anti-British empire history. And I'm optimistic that people are going to rise to the challenge and um, we can transform the population as a whole by making this this question of our identity as a republic uh, one of the major issues, quote-unquote, to call it an issue, of, of the whole campaign. Well, and Dave, let me ask you, because I know you've had some experience in the organizing up in the Northwest with, with people who uh, identify themselves as being part of the Tea Party, but there's a, a very broad range of, of experience, you might say, in the Tea Party. On the one hand, 
you have people like Dick Army, <clears throat> who is moving to take over the anger in the Tea Party and direct it towards supporting Republican Party, uh, what Diane was just describing, the anti-growth Austrian school fascism of Friedrich von Hayek, Milton Friedman, and, and the University of Chicago. Ironically, of course, Barack Obama comes from the University of Chicago and has support from the so-called liberal fascists there. But on the other hand, a lot of the people from the Tea Party who identify with the Tea Party, if you ask them what makes them most angry, it's the bailouts, it's the health care bill. So I think what Diane is describing really is the key issue of education. I, I, I wonder if you can give a sense of the kind of success you've had and the experience you've had with talking to people who have this anger and frustration, but often just blurt things out that they just heard on Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity. Yeah, right. <clears throat> you know, I thought one of the things about Diane's statement, which was most uh, provocative, uh, was the subjective question she posed to the American people, uh, whether or not they were going to be suckered into going along with this policy of, of pitting uh, neighbors against each other, pitting the young against the old, and really, it's it's a kind of a the old the classic British imperial policy: divide and conquer, get people to fight amongst each other, and uh, confuse them about who the enemy is. And you know, I would say this on on the Northwest: um, there's a certain uh, history of the the labor, uh, say around like the Wobblies, and I'm I'm referring to the old school labor, the uh, the kind that will will crack some skulls to actually fight for higher liver, living standards and a decent quality of life and so forth. I think obviously the unions today they have their their issues and their problems, but um, the the key thing here in the Northwest, I think, also if you if you think of back to the the so-called battle in Seattle, well, you know there may be there's obviously elements of that uh, fight against the globalization policy. Uh, you know, there was subversive elements within it. There was the black bloc anarchists, all this kind of stuff. But one thing about the Northwest with that kind of history of the labor and this sort of anti-globalization outlook is that uh, you do have a, you can directly tie, to, or make it clear to people what the real enemy is and that fascism is an economic policy. And I think the best success that we've had uh, organizing is when we can lay out something like the Hitler T4 policy as being directly tied in with the bailout policy. You know, that here we are throwing trillions down a sinkhole called the Inner Alpha Group and the Wall Street, uh, you know, tentacles of the Inner Alpha, uh, that we, we have no problem throwing trillions down that. However, when it comes time for key functions of our state governments, our municipalities, things around this health care that you can make it clear that that is the economic policy. It's infinite bailouts for the corrupt financial institutions and then nothing for the population and, in effect, by design, to, to ratchet down and crush the population under these austerity conditions. And so, you know, we've been able uh, to, you know, in a better degree to be able to, when we can lay that out, we can get people out of this, Smallness, you know, that as Diane was saying, you know, it's the immigrants are the problems, or the uh, they, they lay out a million different problems other than going to the core. So I, I would say that's probably the best uh, way that we've been able is when you, when you can tie it into what the old imperial policy is, and get people to see that fascism at the core is this economic policy. Well, I think it's important because what you just described was the shift from the Franklin Roosevelt legacy in the Democratic Party to the kind of free trade, pro-globalization, pro-deregulation policies that typify someone like your opponent, Adam Smith. And I remember, Dave, in I think it was 1999, the so-called Battle of Seattle, where the labor movement turned out 30,000 marchers against the World Trade Organization conference that took place in Seattle, demanding an end to free trade policies because of the opposition to globalization. And the media instead focused on 200 anarchists who ran down the streets of Seattle breaking shop windows. So, you, you know, Harley, just real quick to interject here. I, you know, I was down there actually. I wasn't a uh, some you know 
protester per se. I, I was only at the beginning of just trying to figure out what this globalization thing was, and I I knew that it was bad. You know, I didn't really know too much about it, but I will say this. You know, you uh, there was actually one rally that I was at where it was a bunch of the unions. I think the longshoremen were putting it on, and there later was a march through the city. Um, and what, what I thought at one point, because the you know the gas canisters were out, the rubber bullets were out, and I, I looked around and I realized that what we were the march that I happened to be in at that point was I saw nurses. I saw this one uh, a nun who was in, actually in a lark, one of these motorized vehicles, with somebody who looked like an anarchist who was actually holding a, a piece of cloth that over this uh, woman, the, the nun's mouth, so she wouldn't inhale the smoke canister. And then I looked and saw these labor guys, and it dawned on me that indeed this wasn't just some a bunch of. Uh, rabble rousers. These were people that were trying to come out and say that globalization was evil. Well, this is what we saw Um, in the summer of 2009 also with the opposition to the health care bill. So I think, uh, let me just summarize what we've discussed so far, and then I want to move on to the solutions, because I want to give our listeners a sense of why it is that, as Diane is saying, we can overcome the pessimism. Uh, You're listening to the LaRue Show. This is our special January 1st, 2011 edition of the LaRue Show. We have two Democratic congressional candidates with me today, uh, Diane Sayre from New Jersey and Dave Christie from Seattle. These are your candidates. These are your voices, the the leaders of the, the movement to bring the country back to the Hamiltonian credit policy, the traditions of the American system, as exemplified by the work of Lyndon LaRouche. And I'd encourage everyone to make a New Year's resolution. You know, forget dieting, forget those things you never do after the first week. Make a resolution that you're going to go to the LaRouche Pack website every single day, maybe twice a day, because of the quality and the quantity of good material we're putting up there that will keep you not just informed of the fight, but give you the intelligence that you need to go out and organize and win this fight now. Because the crash is here, the drive for fascism, we've already gone over the line. Obama, as of January 1st, has made it mandatory that doctors do the kind of -of end-of-life counseling that will take people who are sick, people who are demoralized and depressed and in pain, and convince them that they're better off killing themselves for the sake of the financial system and to not be a burden on society. And why is it that we have to do that? Because we have to bail out banks. We have to bail out the inner alpha group. So this is the fight that we're in. And LaRouchePack.com is the only source of leadership in this country. The, the, the videos that are coming up there every day, the work from the candidates, and we'll soon have websites for each of these candidates that will be accessible through LaRouchePack.com. So your New Year's resolution should be not just to fight fascism, but to become a part of this campaign of these six candidates. Now, Diane, why don't you just go through very briefly the the program that you're going to be running to support and give a sense of how this, this will work. Well, uh, first and foremost, the removal of Barack Obama as president is an absolute necessity. He's made it very clear uh, that nothing of any good can be accomplished while he's president because he'll simply use his executive powers to override anything if we were able to get the Congress to do something good um, with Obama in the White House. It's just impossible. So he has to be removed. And I think he is doing his best to provide us with ammunition to get him out under Section 4 of the 25th Amendment, uh, because he's done some pretty crazy things in the last few weeks. Um, I mean, it's very clear that he's cracking up. And what's required is Biden and others having the courage to just say what's obvious, like the little boy in the emperor's new clothes saying that the emperor was naked. The president is nuts and he should be removed, he should be forced to step down. So that's first and foremost. Um, Secondly is the question of Glass-Steagall, because that would immediately put an end to these bailouts. The old FDR-era separation of legitimate commercial savings and loan institutions from investment banks. And, you know, people can invest, they can 
play the markets or do whatever they want, but if you go to Atlantic City here in New Jersey, you don't get a card at the door that gives you a money-back guarantee. So just like the gambling casinos, if people want to invest or do whatever they're going to do, fine, that is not bailed out. And if Glass-Steagall were to be put in place, it would definitely mean the banks, I mean, all of them are doing like a zillion different things now. So they would be broken up into, you know, the functions, the savings and loan banks would be uh, protected and solvent, and all this toxic paper could be written off. Uh, and that would mean freeing up money to the municipalities, which is really urgent. I mean, this is urgent all over the country. I think Washington State is cutting all kinds of services to the poor, to the sick, and so on. In New Jersey, we have situations which are really um, nearly riotous. In in Newark, they've fired 167 police officers. And over Christmas weekend, there were six shootings of high school students in which four of them were killed. And that was just in a two-day period. So you're just having an explosion of crime born of desperation uh, in that city. So one of the effects of Glass-Steagall would be immediately to get emergency funding back into our states and municipalities to get the police and the fire departments back on the streets and and make sure the nation functions. But then the bigger picture, which Dave uh, can elaborate on much more, is, is NOAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance, which um, the East Coast will play a crucial role because, as we have here, and it's up and down the East Coast, there are these major uh, companies that were involved with NASA in the space program, machine tool shops, you have the old steel industries of Pennsylvania, and uh, these will become very, very important to feed into the building that's going to be going on in the northwestern part of the country as we launch this initially. Well, and so Dave, why don't, why don't you go ahead and, and just give a, a quick summary from the standpoint of the Northwest, but actually as a national, and as LaRouche has been emphasizing, and, and Helga Zepp LaRouche has been emphasizing, this is a global infrastructure plan. So why don't you just give a quick mm-hmm. sense of the NOAPA uh, plus approach? Yeah, well, I think, you know, if you think of the six candidates nationally and where they re- represent in terms of the regions that they represent, uh, these are very strategic regions. And, uh, you know, if you look at the swath from Rachel down through Diane, on the, you know, Rachel in Boston, uh, Diane in, in the Jersey area there with that whole industrial corridor on the East Coast, and obviously that swinging over through the Midwest, Ohio, as a, you know, obvious uh, around the auto industry and related machine tool capabilities all the way over to Detroit where Bill is. And, uh, and so you, if you think of that development uh, or that kind of economic productive capabilities, that will be, that whole region will be absolutely reawakened. And, you know, the, the one core uh, vein of the Nawapa, where you, you bring the water from the Yukon and Mackenzie systems uh, down through Canada, there's a whole swath of that water that comes uh, effectively as a river over to the Great Lakes system um, and then through the, Dakot- the Dakotas as well. And then the obvious other core of it is coming down through uh, British Columbia, through the Rocky Mountain Trench, and then the, the big core of this is in the uh, Idaho, the Sawtooth Mountain System, which is about 500 miles from here, a little, little less than that, at least the start of it. Uh, the obvious employment that this would generate for the Puget Sound area and really the whole corridor from Vancouver down to Portland will be reawakened as well. Um, and then if you look, you know, along that corridor, this sort of development corridor, that obviously extends down to San Francisco where you have uh, summer shields running there. And I think we can look to a certain uh, partnership uh, as that corridor extends down through the West Coast, ultimately down through Mexico, through the Darien Gap, through South America. And, you know, if we look at, if we think of the West Coast in that manner, all the way up through B.C., up in Alaska, over across the Bering Straits uh, in the, through the Eurasian land bridge development that LaRouche has t- talked about for decades now, um, you, you begin to see that we have a whole new Asian orientation 
of development and cooperation amongst what LaRouche has identified as the four powers, Russia, India, China, and the United States. And, and then, of course, you have Keisha and Houston, which would be the NASA, the, the uh, connection that, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, large-scale systems approach that NASA could deal with, which is going to be absolutely crucial for the NAWAPA design. And you begin to see that uh, NAWAPA would not just activate, say, the West Coast or something, even though that's where the bulk of the water comes through, but you see that this is a nationwide uh, reawakening of the core of our industrial and technological engineering capabilities, machine tools, the whole nine. So I think it's a, it really is a nationwide program, not just simply where it is regionally. Well, then it also extends, as you, you pointed out, it, it's the only way we're going to solve the international crisis. We have a situation in Europe now where the euro has collapsed, the European Monetary Union is a is a farcical joke, but there's no one yet willing to bury it. And what LaRouche said uh, yesterday on the LPAC Weekly Report is that while there are some stirrings in Germany and France and, and the every intent should be to get rid of it, it's going to come down to the United States. But I think it's important for people who are listening to this program and supporters of, of LaRouche and also people who don't know LaRouche yet to recognize that we're dealing with a global systemic crisis. There's no place to hide. And one time LaRouche was asked, well, uh, what if we don't get this? And he said, well, you'd better get a spaceship and find another planet because this planet is going to be finished. We're going to be in a dark age. Now, again, I want to come back to this question of the subjective side because, you know, Diane, you're a musician you have a certain sense of, of what LaRouche has been talking about in terms of the classical artistic side of developing the uh, population, and yet both uh, or all the campaigns are oriented toward, at the same time, the unity of mind, of creative mind that's e exemplified by discoveries in science and also classical culture. How do you think? Uh, we, we had a great deal of success in Boston during the campaign with singing with sending out roving squads that were bringing classical music to a population which is used to just noise and, and uh, drum beats and rhythm. Uh, how do you see the, the, uh, our ability to affect these kinds of changes by getting people to lift their minds from the gutter and start looking at the, the heavens? Well, I mean, the music is really important, and I actually maybe hadn't reported as widely as I should, about a year and a half ago here, um, we organized a chorus, and it's a, a boomer chorus, <laughs> which I direct, and um, what we've actually been working on is the chorales from the St. Matthew Passion of Bach, and I have found this to be extremely important and also challenging because um the intensity of the emotion, because this deals, in my mind, with the question of the disciples' relationship to Christ, who is going to be crucified, and he is challenging them, like at Gethsemane, to sit and pray with him, and they fall asleep. And they, and they all say, well, when you're crucified, we're all going to be with you. We're going to be with you to the very last minute. And in fact, what happens is when Christ is, is turned over to the rabble, uh, every single person flees and betrays him. And it's absolutely gut-wrenching because, um, you know, I was, I was thinking of this. I just rewatched a film on um, Washington's Crossing. And, you know, this quality of leadership where George Washington is there with 2,000 bedraggled, starving, freezing men having lost every single battle, and he says, we have to cross this river. And people say, are you crazy? <laughs> or they say, well, you know, can we wait? I mean, we're freezing. We don't have any supplies. And he said, no, because if we wait, we will lose everything, because when the river freezes over, the Hessians can just march across, they vastly outnumber us, and it'll be the end. And it was a moment of extreme um, necessity, and he personally took upon himself the responsibility of whether this 
succeeded or not, and he said, I know my men will follow, they trust me. They trust me. My, so he, you know, and he was able, as people know, it was a complete miracle in a sense um, that he pulled this thing off. But I think the point of great art uh, and and music, in this case, the passion, is that people are, by going to a, a concert or a performance, they're forced to look within themselves and consider, what would I do in this situation? How will I be better than these people on the stage? Could I be as strong as this one? Could I be stronger than this one? And... Um, At any rate, so we've been working on this very intensively, and what I decided we should do, because I wanted to put a lot of pressure on my choir, is that we should do a performance. (laughs) And uh, we did at a little church uh, not too far from here in Hackensack. And um, we did the chorales from the Passion, and then we had um, uh, some spirituals that were sung by Jessica Tremblay, and then we sang Christmas carols. And it was small, maybe 30 or so people attended, but I was actually astounded at how profoundly moved people were, including one extremely pessimistic guy who was brought by his wife. She contributes to the movement regularly, and and he is not supposed to know and uh, doesn't want to do that. And what happened was actually that um, he was overjoyed, and he kept saying, you can still reach people. You can reach the American people. I know you can reach them. So, Diane, I assume assume you'll be taking your chorus out as part of your campaign staff. Yes, they'll be going out. uh, There's a big debate raging here about whether they're ready for this. (laughs) We don't have any choice, do we? (laughs) Dave, let let me just take this a step further, because what Diane is talking about is this question of immortality. You know, to what, you know, leaders are people who actually have already, in a sense, gone to the future. In their minds, they've, they've conducted a thought experiment about what's needed in the future. This is how Lyndon LaRouche does his forecasting. You know, what is essential for the future? And in classical artistic composition, especially the music of, of uh, Bach and, and Mozart and Beethoven, uh, you have a very clear sense of this, the, the taking on of this question of immortality. But the same thing is true of, of great infrastructure, because when you're working on a project, you're not thinking about the paycheck tomorrow you're actually building something that your grandchildren and and generations far beyond that will benefit from. And I I think that's something that we can also use to take a demoralized population and point them in the direction of using their imagination to create a better future. Yeah. No, um, uh, LaRouche would always have that uh, uh, polemic, I guess, uh, on the idea of the grandfather taking the grandson and to a to a project that he had been a part of and saying, you know, I built that and that kind of pride of having passed something on. Um as is kind of a funny note, I just uh, I remember as a kid walking around with my grandfather. He was actually a the lock master at the uh, uh he was with the Army Corps of Engineers for the Sioux locks the locks connecting Lake Superior to the other lakes in the Great Lakes system there. And uh, and I always remember walking along with him in any sort of construction site, even if it was just some guy with a backhoe in his yard, you know, digging out a foundation or something, and he'd just be sit there fascinated, you know. And I thought it was somewhat strange when I was a kid, sort of old-fashioned, and but it's funny that now that those kind of thoughts come back that uh, – that was what that generation represented. And uh, that's the other thing that about this NWAPA program is that we're, we're dealing with a situation where much of the skill level, you, you have the older generation, say the late 70s, and uh, people in their 80s, uh, who still have that conception of how you'd carry out a large-scale project. Now, of course, we've never dealt with anything as large as NWAPA, but it but these guys have a sense of how you the questions that would come up around developing this uh, the NWAPA pro- program, right? Um, then you also have the skilled labor in terms of the machine tool, and you know many of these guys are in their 60s and 70s now, 
Uh, but yet you have a generation which can play some video games and uh, you know run, run their cell phones fine, but have no skills in this in this domain. And the other point that I'd like to emphasize is that for an Awapa to work, this has got to happen now. We, there's no we can't wait or be waiting around and saying, well, it'd be nice if we get it going in ten years because by then the skilled uh, capabilities, the the guys in their 80s that would be able to do this won't be around. And they've got to get that in part that the the actual know-how of being able to carry out an immortal mission. You know, immortality is not just something where you just say it and it sounds nice and maybe you represent it with some music and, and so forth and, and think that that's it, right? That real immortality is making it happen, building the, the necessary future for your nation and your society. And I I think that the scientific conceptions and the moral conceptions feed into that making that happen and that's you know that's effectively what we represent uh nationally and internationally is that overall conception the unity of the science the unity of the art the unity of the uh you know the human condition well i think that this is a good place we're coming toward the end and i think it's a good place to resituate this question of the urgency because it's not just that we're going to lose these skill levels, we're going to be killing a population and, and reducing a population below the level that's necessary if you're actually going to have a recovery. And one of the, the key elements of, of LaRouche's economic policy is this question of how civilization advances based on creative discoveries of universal physical principles and how you have to have a growing population at an improving standard of living to be able to carry out these tasks. And at this point... At the end of 2010, the beginning of 2011, we have a Hitler in the White House. We have a gutless Congress, an immoral Congress, a population which has been beaten down, but which is angry. And it's under these circumstances that we're introducing a solution, the LaRouche candidates slate. And, uh, Diane, I, we have time for you to, to say one last uh, word to the people who are listening today, what would you like to leave them with? I think they should do what you said, which is adopt as their New Year's resolution that they get on the website every day. And we'll be seeing you on the website. I, I know soon we'll have a website up for you, but for the time being, people can go to the LaRouchePack.com website and see a statement issued by Diane, uh, what, yesterday, I think. Yeah. And then, uh, Dave, you have some last thoughts? Uh, well, I think we've covered quite a bit. I, I would just say this, uh, given that Diane's out in that region there, and uh, you have Governor Christie, that I just make it, make it clear I have no relation to Governor Christie. And <laughs> I'd also like to add that when he You're talks of trimming... you than he is. <laughs> I was just going to say, when he talks of trimming the fat, uh, <laughs> maybe he should uh, think uh, about himself first. But, maybe uh, he should use that as a New Year's resolution. Exactly. <laughs> but, Dave, I think it's important Michelle, to note... Uh, go ahead, Diane. Michelle Obama could design a diet for him. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's important to note that while you have no relation either uh, uh, as a relative or intellectually with Governor Christie, your opponent, Adam Smith, shares the name and the philosophy of the enemy of the United States, the British Empire's propagandist, Adam Smith. And your campaign and the campaign of the LaRouche Slate will be the fight to once and all demonstrate to the American people that Adam Smith and free trade, free market, globalization is part of a policy of a small group of financiers centered around the Inter-Alpha Group who are still out to do what Adam Smith in 1776 tried to do, which is to destroy the idea of the United States. And I think we can end with this point. Our candidate slate will be a revival of the American system of physical economy and the dreams of the Renaissance in Europe to bring back the American Republic and spread these ideas through infrastructure and through an, an overall fight to the whole world. So this is an optimistic message for 2011. Diane and Dave, thank you very much for joining us on the LaRouche Show today. Thanks, Thanks Harley. a lot, Harley. And we'll be having you back along with the other candidates, Rachel Brown, Keisha Rogers, Bill Roberts, and Summer Shields. So go to LaRouchePack.com, 
at least twice a day, and we'll be back with you next Saturday. And don't forget, January 22nd, Lyndon LaRouche's next webcast.